And turn off your mic too, Mike. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sean. I'm the artistic director of the Ottawa International Writers Festival. Welcome to our first event of 2022 and the start of our 25th anniversary season. We're broadcasting from the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg. We recognize our duty as settlers on this land, the work to repair the harms perpetrated upon First Nations, Métis, and Indigenous peoples, and we acknowledge the ongoing trauma colonialism continues to inflict. I want to begin, as always, by thanking you for supporting authors and booksellers through these difficult times. Our official bookseller is Perfect Books on Elgin Street, and I know wherever you are right now, there's an independent bookseller nearby who would be more than happy to sell you some great books. We're gearing up for an exciting spring that includes a return to in-person events in April and May, and hopefully a full fall season of live events, including a local launch, I hope, for Brandy Morin's forthcoming book, Our Voice of Fire. But let me say that as ready as we are to welcome live audiences back and to see you all again, we will always put safety first, and a return to in-person programming is not a return to normal. What we heard from so many this year is that accessible online content is a lifeline for many who are uncomfortable or unable to attend in-person events, so we will be doing everything we can to ensure that universal accessibility is not sacrificed as we return to live community events. Special thanks to all our patrons and to the Ottawa Public Library, the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario, the City of Ottawa, the Ontario Arts Council, the Canada Council for the Arts, Carleton University, and CBC for their ongoing support. I'm so excited to be launching our 25th season with a conversation on policing. It's a topic recent events downtown have painfully spotlighted. Clearly, as we saw during the trucker tantrum, different kinds of protesters are treated very differently, and the laws of the land seem to be applied differently depending on skin color and wealth and other considerations that ignore not just the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, but our most basic ideas of fairness and equity. Thank you all for tuning in to discuss who is served and what is protected. Our host tonight is Erica Eiffel, columnist with the Hill Times, co-host of the Bad and Bitchy podcast, and founder of Not In My Color, an anti-racism and equity consultancy. She'll introduce us to our acclaimed guests and will lead the conversation for the next hour or so. So let's give a warm virtual welcome to our host this evening, Erica Eiffel. Hello, everyone, and welcome to, I would say, the 2022 season opening of the Ottawa Writers Festival. So today we're going to talk about some really heavy topics, including white supremacy, policing, capitalism, um, race, gender, and how that all works. And with us, joining us for this wonderful discussion is Brandy Morin, who is a French Cree and Iroquois journalist from Treaty 6 in Alberta, Can in Alberta Canada. She is based outside of Edmonton, uh, my hometown, and has contributed to the CBC, the, Ab the Aboriginal People's Television Network, National News, and the Indian Country Today Media Network. In 2019, she won a Human Rights Reporting Award from the Canadian Association of Journalists and has worked with CBC's Beyond 94 project to track the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action progress. And I just want to say personally that I became aware of Brandy and, and her reporting during, during a lot of the Wet'suwet'en protests. And um, when we were putting together a podcast about it, I came across a lot of her work. So I just want to say, first of all, thank you for all that work that you've been doing. And thank you for really just risking yourself to bring us that information. Our second guest, Desmond Cole, who is um, a wonderful author, best-selling author for his 2017, The Skin We're In, um, A Year of Black Resistance and Power, which documents the year 2017 and the struggle against anti-black racism. In, tw in 2015, he wrote a cover story for Toronto Life magazine called The Skin I'm In, where he exposed the racist actions of the Toronto Police Force, 
detailing the do dozens of times he had been stopped and interrogated under the controversial practice of carding. 2017 saw him follow up the Toronto Life story with the CBC Docs special, The Skin We're In, Pulling Back the Curtain on Racism in Canada. Um, those links actually are in the show notes. I'm going to plug Bad and Bitchy because we actually had Desmond on um, in 2020 when he released the book. So we have all of those links in that episode. So welcome, Desmond. It's good to see you again. Thank you so, so much. It's nice to be with you. So let's like, I would like to set up with a framework, right? When we're talking about these issues about policing, about white supremacy. Um, so I'm in Ottawa, obviously, and we had the convoy here. And I just want to hear um, sort of from both of your perspectives, how you see sort of carceral actions by the state and like what framework kind of guides you or or do you look through go ahead desmond okay starting desmond, with a small question your negro fault your negro frolics please <laughs> well you know um i i think that the way the way that i approach the these things is generally speaking, to say that they are old, to say that um, the way that state power works isn't new, and it has the same purpose now as it always has. I think one of the big like tricks or deceptions of living in the time that we live in is that everybody always wants to talk about how much better things have gotten. They <laughs> want a white liberal settler way to congratulate themselves for what they perceive as like allowing other groups of people besides them to have a little share of the pie and um, that's not new so we have to start with um you know pre-colonization when indigenous peoples were here without the presence of western white settlers and the attempts over you know generations to slowly come and figure out ways to usurp people of their land and then all of the things that had had come had to come with that so taking uh, people's languages away taking people's children away importing african people in chains to come and work the land and to come and serve white people um it would be nice if it was true that all of that had ended but all you have to do is look at a prison in canada to know that it hasn't ended all you have to do is look who's being apprehended in the child welfare system to know that the legacies of residential schools for example have never ended who's killed by the police um we have to look at state violence not as some kind of accident or liberal exception to the normal peaceful canadian society but as the rule and it's only through um reading and listening um to people teach us about this that i've been able to come to that understanding and to try and build on it through my work and you know it's it's because of um you know, people like Robin Maynard writing Policing Black Lives, uh, that I was able to write my book, right? And building on books like that and Black Like Who, Ronaldo Walcott, and others who have done this work before me to remind everybody, uh, this is not an exception. This is how Canada has been built, right? It's, it's uh, the system isn't broken. In other words, it was built this way. Absolutely. <laughs> ha! I mute myself and then I start talking. Okay, but we do stand on the shoulders of our ancestors, do we not, Brandy? Um. So I just wanted to uh, agree with what Desmond said. In Canada, the policing system, you know, started with the RCMP, 
And the RCMP was literally formed yep. to clear the plains of the Indian problem. Mm -hmm. It is built upon um, a doctrine of uh, white supremacy, of making way for the interests of the European settlers. And it's these RCMP systems that enforced the Canadian laws to steal our children and force them uh, to attend residential schools. The RCMP have been involved in allowing the violence against our women you know, the, the ongoing crisis of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. And in many cases, the RCMP themselves have been perpetrators of this violence. And so all of the different policing systems and the way that they operate are stemmed from the RCMP. And um, I mean, it's, it's something that, <clears throat> like Desmond said, operates from those rooted principles um, you know, that have never really been transformed, that have never been uprooted. And we can see the uh, blatant in, you know, um, um, what, what's the word? Um, I mean, our, pr our prison systems in regards to Indigenous, uh, we make up only 30% of the population. Indigenous women now make up over 50% of uh you know female prisoners in the country and overall indigenous people make up 30 percent uh despite um it's just it's just absolutely you know outrageous so you know when you're when you're looking at how things are going down today um it's not surprising given these you know where where it all stems from so in terms of the full carceral system so it's not only um the rcmp it is the court system as um one of your ricochet stories actually talked about um how corporate uses the court system to um to circumvent even court rulings in favor yeah. of indigenous peoples so bring us like let's bring capitalism into that and how capitalism really is um, sort of like where capitalism is the basis for this theft, basically, and how that factors into the police response. Um, yeah, so, I mean, that's that's always been, I mean, Canada is an extractive nation. They, they, they came, uh, you know, the, the settlers came and established this ex extractive state. And, um, you know, even Canada itself declares it wants to become the mining nation of the world. Um, so, um, you know, when it's going into the situations regarding the Wet'suwet'en uh, people that have been battling a pipeline on their unceded lands, uh, they have not given consent to the company or, you know, to the governments that are backing them, despite um, um, you know, the Supreme Court of Canada identifying that those Wet'suwet'en leaders have the title and rights to those areas, uh, the company has been able to circumvent these uh, judicial systems in order to gain injunctions. And via those injunctions, um, and it's a civil injunction, I have to note, it's not even a, a criminal one. Um, it's brought in massive uh, police policing and massive resources and, you know, violence. We're talking armies of police, right? With AK-47, you know, rifles and snipers and helicopters and attack dogs to enforce the interests, uh, you know, of this uh, extractive industry in order for these companies and the governments and everybody that uh, benefits from these projects, right? um in order to get their projects through so um you know it's all definitely tied together you know uh, when it comes down to it and when it comes to the ideologies of you know the the, the state of canada i mean it's it's so opposite and foreign to so many indigenous nations and there is such a clash that's happening there right i mean our many indigenous laws 
that go back for millennia and and their own judicial systems within you know their their traditional systems are don't don't align with um you know with with the state and um and especially you know capitalism but unfortunately it's capital capitalism is is ravaging you know our society around the world oh you muted it again <laughs> I'm sorry. I I was just saying. I noticed that when um, when we had the truckers here in Ottawa um, for two weeks, uh, leadership was telling us that eh, it's a it's an Ottawa problem. Uh, well, they're protesting. Leave them alone. Uh, and it is not until the Ambassador Bridge was threatened that all of a sudden everybody jumped to attention. So, I mean, obviously capitalism is basically the tenant by which we live. Is it not Den uh, Desmond? Den I mean, I mean, I've learned so much from Brandy's own reporting about this uh, in terms of uh, Brandy, your excellent reporting on coastal gas link in mm -hmm. BC. And the reality, for example, that the RCMP's pension fund is invested in CGL. Like, this can really help us to think about and understand what the literal and um, um, kind of even like a more um, psychological, if you want, or, or kind of like future looking investments are. So if we ask like, well, what's the in, what's the what's the RCMP's stake in this pipeline and going to violently evict people? Well, they literally have a financial stake. They're literally like, in the future, I can provide for my family by investing in this company that's going to take people off of their lands. It's not even a metaphor. Like you know, this is literally an investment by the police in their own work to take people off of unceded territory. You know, L. Jones has been writing for so many years in Nova Scotia about Telmate, a company that operates a lot of the phone systems in prisons in this country, and the exorbitant rates that Telmate is charging people to use the phone to connect with loved ones. And so, like, the, um, the lesson from these kinds of stories is that this isn't, like, racism is not disconnected from a capitalist imperative, right? Like they are together. Like sometimes I think people imagine that you're engaging in racism because you have some kind of personal character flaw or that you've been taught not to like a group of people or you've never had interaction with that group of people and so you have negative stereotypes towards them. But actually we can't understand white supremacy and racism and anti-blackness without asking who benefits from this discrimination, who is actually getting something out of people in jail, having to stay there and be captive and be subject to a set of rules, who's benefiting from that? When you put somebody through the system and you have to pay the judge or the justice of the peace, the court reporter, the bailiffs, all the people who clean the courtroom, who schedules all of the trials every day and like our courts are extremely backlogged, but like people are literally paying their mortgage and putting their families through school and whatnot, keeping the lights on through this system of harm, right? So even, uh, you know, we were at a demonstration this past weekend at the Special Investigations Unit in Mississauga, Ontario. This is the uh, Ontario so-called oversight body that's supposed to investigate police when they are involved in a killing, um, uh, a, a suspected sexual assault, or what they classify as serious injury, which is a very high threshold under the SIU, so very few things even get investigated. But, you know, you can't help but realize that even though 97% of SIU investigations result in no charge against the police, People are getting paid to go through the motions of pretending to investigate the police and that that's how they support themselves and their families and their other people in their lives. 
So somebody's benefiting from racism. It's not a system of discrimination for discrimination's sake. It is a profit-driven uh, enterprise. Oh, muted. <laughs> <laughs> I think you should stay, you know, I think I, you should stay off mute to be completely off. Forget it. I'm leaving it on. I'm not muting <laughs> anymore. So you're going to hear whatever background noise. <laughs> so I, I, you know, it, it's when you start thinking about racism as a profitable enterprise that things just start falling into place. You're like, oh, because a lot of the times, um, we're told that, oh, diversity is profitable or something like that. And what it seems like is that part of that system is to bring people into sort of like that administrative role of causing harm because that you can't fight the system if your meal depends on it or if your mortgage depends on it or you're, you're putting your kids through school on it. And, you know, it leaves this like impossible, almost impossible, like set of choices for people who really don't want to do that. Um, and then there are people who do. So I guess, you know, when we talk about um, the systems, the, the other thing too, I find is that Canada is really administratively violent too. Um, you see this a lot in the immigration system. And uh, you see this a lot with um, processing of um, like court processing times, as you said, it, you know, this is we're creating backlogs here. Who gets to be out on bail is a whole nother thing. Who gets to be um, who who is given bail is a whole nother thing. I mean, there's so many little bits and pieces of the system, isn't there, Brandy? That's like that that also create this burden this 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 burden of white supremacy of administrative right supremacy that is used to like keep sorry for the reference but keep the trains running on time you know absolutely and um you know i actually write glad you reports on the side and a glad you mm -hmm. reports are for indigenous offenders and they are written about the offender's life history. They take into consideration the impacts of residential schools and colonialism. And uh, the judge reads it, takes into consideration for alternative sentence, sentencing. Now, I've done well over 100 of these reports of interviewing Indigenous offenders one-on-one, -on -one, learning their life story. And I'm telling you, every single one of them that are in these prison systems that I have interacted with are dealing with intergenerational trauma. They are mm -hmm. intergenerational survivors of the residential school system, of, you know, traumas that extend in, within their communities from all of these impacts who are out there trying to cope with little to no resources yet when they're in these jail systems they're offered nothing they're offered mm -hmm. no healing resources no rehabilitation and they just keep going you know through these systems throughout their whole lifetime it's astonishing that like i, I always wonder like you think that by now they would see these patterns like the 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 officials and you know uh these these systems would see and try to look for solutions try to find another way and they they don't they're not and thank god for something like these gladly reports that are you know now in law that the judges have to take this into consideration and we are able to offer you know ways for um these individuals to heal so that they can get out of these systems. But I can confirm, can confirm that outside of this, there is nothing there. It, it, it's, it's, yeah. And, and, and um, it's definitely, it's, it's a for-profit industry. I, you know, when I think of, you know, sort of how you go through the system and where you start, I mean, we could we could talk about the school to prison pipeline, but there's also um, I was talking to a lawyer 
who who deals a lot with young offenders. And what he told me was that by law, um, infractions are a way to get people into the system. So yeah. can you yeah. can you explain what that's like? What how does that work? Why is Definitely. by law? Oh, now he's the one muted. You're muted. <laughs> <laughs> Yikes. Yeah, I, I was saying I'm happy to talk about that because, you know, um, the first couple of years that I lived in Toronto were really difficult years. And um, I spent a lot of the time in my first couple of years here without permanent housing. Uh, I used the shelter system. I couch surfed. I did all that. And um, you really start to get an idea of how the bylaw system at the local level really pushes people into the criminal justice system. So I'll give you an example. Uh, I can distinctly remember there is a man uh, sitting and asking for money inside of Queen Subway Station in downtown Toronto. I gave him some change that I had. I was chatting with him for a little bit and I turned to walk away. And as I turned to walk away, these two um, Toronto Transit Commission uh, special constables, as they're called, come up to this black man sitting on the ground asking for money. And they start harassing him and asking him 20 questions. So I turned around to go back and I stood at a distance glaring at them and I stood in an area where they were kind of seeing me they're looking past the guy now and they're seeing that I'm watching them I wanted them to know that somebody was watching them and one of the guys the special constable says like do you know this man and I was like yeah actually yeah I do right not that I know why that would matter but um you know I just continued staring and watching and they gave the man a ticket. And so when they went away, I went back and I said, are you all right? And he's like, yeah. And I said, well, do you mind me asking, like, what did they just do? And he said, um, they've given me uh, a court summons for this ticket that they've given me. And that they said, if I don't show up, then they can put a warrant out for my arrest. Mm. Um, I don't know who have accrued thousands of dollars in provincial offenses tickets for pissing outside when there's nowhere to piss and the business owners won't let you, for sleeping outside and pitching a tent because you're not allowed to pitch a structure in the park, um, for asking for money because there are so-called aggressive solicitation laws in bylaw under the Ontario so-called Safe Streets Act. And any of these things, if you don't keep up with them or pay them can ultimately result in a warrant being issued for your arrest. So now because you got a panhandling ticket or a set of panhandling tickets, you can literally go to jail. And if you breach the um, arrest conditions of something like this, it's just as serious as breaching for any other criminal offense. So the system has you really penned in at that point. It's this is all by design and 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 one of my real frustrations about the explosion of people living outdoors since COVID began, right? Of people camping in our cities and towns, in, our, in, in parks and in other public places. It is very difficult to find even a handful across this country of elected municipal leaders, city councillors, Reeves, whatever the case may be, who are like, we just need to change these bylaws so that you're allowed to pitch a tent outside because there's nowhere else for you to go. The shelters are full or they're full of COVID, right? There's no affordable housing across our country. There's nowhere for you to go. But this bylaw says you also can't shelter yourself in a park without breaking another law. These laws, these vagrancy laws, pissing, pooping outside, um, um, asking for money too close to a bank machine, pitching a tent in a park. These kinds of vagrancy laws are inhumane and they have to go. They target drug users, they, charge, they target people who are unhoused. 
And there's no serious conversation about alleviating this kind of like everyday suffering while keeping those vagrancy laws in place. They have to be gotten rid of and we have to press local politicians to 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 review them because you, you just can't live in a, a, a world where people have been forced into the most desperate public situations and then their public existence is once again criminalized. That's a non-starter. Agreed. Agreed. Um, to be honest, it seems like, you know, basically all of our systems are um, predicated on some sort of policing. Uh, and if if not, even if you don't have police in there, you have principals, for example, who will call the police on children and things like that. We are one big policing nation. Are we not, Brandy? Like what? I, I just think about how carceral we have become as a society to deal with anything we bring in the police for 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 the for the most innocuous things i mean i would say it depends on what that is because look at look at what went down at the trucker convoy protest i don't know if you if you i mean you know the, the cops started becoming a little bit more aggressive you know in the last few days of the showdown in ottawa but in alberta where you know, the convoyers were blocking the border, an international border causing multi, multi million dollars of, you know, in delays and, and losses. We had the police down there shaking hands, lining up to shake hands, you know, with uh, these, you know, these, these so called protesters. So I would say it depends on, you know, on the, on who, just like the topic, who is being served? who is being protected. And in something like that, in those instances, I'd say that the interests of these mostly white convoy, you know, organizers and uh, protesters, their interests were, you know, at the forefront. And the police was, a, was the policing in these situation was the last, um, you know, was the last resource. Well, their interests just, yeah, go ahead, Des. I just wanted to add that, and yet, what's happening in the aftermath now? The province of Ontario has just announced that it wants to um, have expanded powers, right, to say that it is illegal uh, uh, to have blockades of the street. So they are definitely thinking about what happened at the Ambassador Bridge and what happened in Coots as a way of justifying that kind of legislation. But who is it actually going to be used against? I mean, the thing that's glaring for me is yeah. that uh, yeah. you didn't need an emergency act to go into unceded Wet'suwet'en territory, nor did you need an emergency okay. act to clear people out of shelters in Halifax and Vancouver and Toronto last summer. You don't need an emergency act to go and harass people at Six Nations of the Grand River. You know, I don't believe in these police powers and the fact that they're being mobilized in the aftermath of Ottawa when at the time the police had every ability to do something and just chose not to. It is something to be extremely wary of because I will say like the people who were out in the streets in Ottawa, many of them were very cynically saying, well, once the government uses their emergency powers, they're never going to take them back. Well, we might not agree with them politically, but they were actually correct on that analysis. The government is always using these kinds of opportunities to consolidate its power, but the next time it might be used against us, but I would also say like, it doesn't need to be an emergency order for it to happen to us anyway. We've, they've been doing a good job of coming after us without ever expanding the power. So when they do expand the powers, it's, it's black and indigenous and other racialized groups of people. Yeah. It's queer and trans people. It's poor people yeah. who should be watching out because uh, we are the target of all of these kinds of ideas. 
And at this, you know, what I saw in Ottawa too was that, you know, well, what actually came out in Ottawa was that, um, you know, even some of these, uh, these, the rank and file police officers had donated to the convoy. So, you know, again, you know, this, this convoy was aligned too with, with a political stripe that supported them. I mean, this isn't, these aren't people who don't have the ear of power, for example. So I, I, you know, what I find is that we're in really murky sort of waters where you have, you know, you have kind of, on one hand, you have protests or demonstrations by Black and Indigenous peoples for rights, for those expansion of rights. On the other hand, we have this. And, you know, what I find is that if we follow power, we could pretty much get the answer. If we follow power, we can actually, you know, frame it in a way that, you know, makes sense. And that is the point, like who has power and who has power in each of these situations um, will tell us who benefits, I guess. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, how do I, we, can, yeah. Can I just quickly reflect on that too? Because uh, two of the powerful, influential people in Ottawa during the convoy situation uh, were black men in positions of either elected office or political authority. And here I'm talking specifically about Peter Slawley, the now former police chief in Ottawa who resigned. And I'm talking about uh, Ralston King, who mm -hmm. was a former uh, member of the police services board in Ottawa, and he also resigned. And um, I've from the seen board, a lot not of, from council. He, he resigned from the board, that's correct. He, yeah. the, the so-called oversight of the police, he was part of that. And he resigned from that as well uh, over anger that the uh, the head of the police board, Julia Deans, was being unfairly blamed for what was going on. And so he resigned in solidarity with her. And there was a lot of outpouring of sympathy for these two men because they are black and because it was seen somehow as though they were part of the solution rather than the very people upholding and justifying the policing system. And I do want to just say that um, we are so easily fooled sometimes by black faces in high places. And so when you, Erica, talk about, well, where does the power reside? The power resides with the police. And so if your job is to make excuses for the police, like Peter Slowly, their chief and their head politician, I'm not going to feel sorry for you that you have to resign and that people say, oh, well, you know, Peter Slawley, a black man, was the first person to fall. He signed up to take all of the blame for the police. That's what the job is to be chief. Like he wanted to be the one as a black person to justify that police are good, that we can trust them, that we can reform policing instead of having to defund and abolish the police. Peter Slawley wanted to be that guy. Ralston King has said, you can't defund the police in Ottawa. So the best you can do is throw some money at community services instead because defunding is actually impossible. I don't care that these men are black. They are upholding the system that is killing all of us. And we cannot be so easily fooled as to say black people equals no criticism and accountability, even when they are running systems of harm. It's the system of harm, as you're saying, Erica, where the power resides, that's the problem. You don't get to be a good guy inside of a system of harm while asking us to keep believing in it. And and I really, mm. I want people to reflect on that in Ottawa. Well, it's, in, go ahead, Brandy. Um, you know, the police have the power, but I would like to find out who the police answer to because as yeah. far as I understand, they answer to nobody. They are accountable to nobody. I think the clo closest thing that they could be maybe accountable to is literally the media. And they have been working to, um, you know, to, uh, to block media from, from many of these different, you know, demonstrations where they're bringing in this violence. I mean, I've been stopped by police doing my job. I've been lied to. Mm -hmm. 
But I am on the record through affidavits. I've felt threatened, you know, by the police. I have witnessed, you know, violence, uh, you know, even in this past year. And I remember being on the job and, you know, for instance, in Ferry Creek and, and, and different places and at Wet'suwet'en. And I remember thinking like, you know, police are breaking people's arms, tackling them to arrest them, you know, for civil injunctions. And, and it's just absolutely absurd. And I'm, and I, and I, and I remember talking to my editor and I said, like, what does the public do? Like who, who polices the police? Who do they, who are they accountable to? And he said, they're accountable to nobody. They do and <laughs> whatever they want. And that's a really I, scary thing. It is scary. I don't believe that people actually understand that nobody has control over the police. Nobody. Not even, <laughs> you know what? Not even the police services themselves have full control over the rank and file if you want to bring in unions, right? Because police unions are a whole nother show that um, that have prevented a lot of the so-called reforms, which, I mean, how do you reform a system that's rotten in the first place? I don't know. Um, that's That to me is... I, 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 so yeah. what are the answers? What are, what do you, like, how, how do you go about making any, you know, legitimate transformation? Like, if they're accountable to nobody, the only thing that could impact them is literal money, right? The, de the defunding or whatever, like, what, what is the answer, Desmond, if, if they, if they wield all this power? I mean, I mean, this is this is why defunding and abolition work needs to continue. Um, the mechanisms that do exist to hold the police accountable don't work, and they're not designed to work. And again, when I talk about Ralston King saying, "We, the police oversight, don't have any power over the police," like he's he's telling us everybody, like mm -hmm. he's just mm -hmm. telling us really honestly. Even if we wanted to, I don't know if legally we could do anything to control this group of people. And at some point, and I think about this a lot, municipalities that are the direct funders of the police are going to have to come up against the Police Services Act in each of their provinces. Because it's the Police mm -hmm. Services Act that mandates the level of policing that each municipality has to have. So the government basically forces municipalities and says you have to have X amount of policing in order to ensure public safety. And so the argument from people like Ralston King and, and others is the, well, we can't do anything about that. The province is our master. And if the province says you municipalities fund police in this way, well, that's the law and we can't do anything about it. But of course, if no one ever wanted to cha challenge an unjust law, uh, none of us would be here having this conversation today. So, um, at some point, municipalities have to say no to the funding model and to be willing to go over to court and to fight a nasty battle against it. And in the meantime, uh, try to defund services and reallocate those resources into life saving interventions that are actually going to do something for people. But I have written a lot about what out of control policing looks like. And, and Erica, you talked about the uh, unions. I don't call them unions because uh, no other so-called union in Canada gets to negotiate with guns in their possession. These guys are an association. It's the police associations, not the police union. Let's call them. And it's, they are not a union. Okay. The police go and undermine the collective bargaining rights of other groups of people by coming and pushing them away when they demonstrate. Okay. The police mm -hmm. in Toronto were actively campaigning against the fight for $15 minimum wage campaign because as cops, they feel threatened by working class people organizing. The police do not have unions. They have associations that represent their violent interests. And in Ottawa, that association after Daniel Monsian murdered Abdurrahman Abdi in 2016, the police association in Ottawa, under Matt Scoff created wristbands with Daniel yeah. Monsian badge number on them. So they venerated a killer 
and they distributed those wristbands. They sold them across the country. Um, the idea that you can ask those folks to change and that you can sit down and negotiate with them, we are wasting our time with that. We have to defund and we have to abolish and put those resources into things that actually support the communities that the police have been terrorizing all of this time. It's those communities that deserve those resources, not their police forces. But I mean, it's been almost two years since George Floyd was murdered, since, you know, the public at large has been calling for defunding. And I've seen nothing but increases yes. across the board. So that model like, or that those asks are failing. Well, I, I suppose that they're going to keep failing until they start succeeding. Right. But um, right, right. This, is, this is this is a new era that we've entered into. Uh, I was just on a, a, a panel discussion today where somebody from Winnipeg told us that this year, Winnipeg's police budget constitutes 27% of the city's spending. Yeah. 27%. You go and you buy up enough uh, home security and weapons mm -hmm. and attack dogs to spend 27% of your own income on protecting yourself, if that's what you think you're doing. And let's see how much you have left over to eat. Let's see how much you have left over to clothe yourself, to have an education. But we're not talking about an individual or a family. We're talking about a giant municipality in Winnipeg's case with what, about a million people there? Like 27% of all operating costs spent on the police. And then, you know, what is left over for parks? What's left over for transit? What's left over for water purification? Like basic Winnipeg has the highest, services. It, Winnipeg has the highest indi urban indigenous population in Canada too. And yeah, again, so that's no, that's, that that's no mistake. Coincidence. Exactly, yeah. it's no mistake. What's, what's Toronto now, like over a billion now? Toronto's police budget has been over a billion dollars for the last couple of years. It is rising once again. And uh, another thing for people to be really um, wary of. So when I talk about the way that institutions try to use race to cover up what they're really doing. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons that the Toronto police force justified its budget increase this year was saying, well, there are all these hate crimes going on in the COVID I, era yeah. and there's mm -hmm. anti-Asian hate now and there's all these yeah. hate crimes that are going on. And so you need to reinvest in the police so that we can deal with hate crimes. Now the police are and, and then walking community crime. policing, by well, the way. Yeah, we don't we don't know what community policing means. No one can ever tell us. But I mean policing <laughs> is itself the hate crime. And 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 if we can look at it another way I look at the number of police forces in Ontario where women, gender nonconforming and trans yep. people talk about the horrific harassment and violence that they experience inside of the police force. Um, police officers are far more likely than members of the general public to commit sexual assault, intimate partner violence, mm -hmm. but we keep giving them money for things like anti-trafficking measures but like you're giving money to the perpetrators, right? Mm -hmm. So as long as we get stuck in this cycle where the police are the only intervention, there is no real way forward. And the more paranoid we get, the bigger these budgets get, the more paranoid the yes. white settler population gets about you know the world being a scary place, the more the rest of us are going to pay with it, pay for it through increased policing. Well, it's like how we're increasing military spending. Are we, yeah. are we, what do we do? Like, well, uh, it, we, it, it, it's we, all the we same had damn to. complex. <laughs> yes, it is. And, and I think that that's a good analogy too, because this is the excuse, this, this aggression in Russia by Russia and Ukraine um, is the excuse. Of course, I'm anti-war, but anti-war means you don't ramp up creation of weapons, fighter jets, missiles in response to other forms of aggression. Like this isn't going to end by shells and bombs. 
if it did, like the West has more than enough ammunition to go in there and confront Vladimir Putin right now. Like it's going to end when there's a negotiated peace deal. And um, I think that in the same way in our communities, the violence that we see in our communities that we actually all want to have addressed is not going to stop because there's just so many cops that they just mm -hmm. own yeah. every block and stomp down any perceived like form of social dysfunction. We need to create peace in our communities by actually supporting people. And, and we see when we make these interventions, we, we see what happens. Like when we invest in children's, breakfast programs, when we invest in making sure that people stay in school and graduate, right? When we invest in people being able to have a little bit more, like the basic income pilot project in, in Ontario, which Doug Ford canceled as soon as he got into office in 2018, like that was a way of being like, what would people's lives be like if they didn't have to live on the subsistence that ODSP and Ontario Works gives them? What if disabled people had like the needs that were like unique to their personal life instead of just an arbitrary Ontario disability check? Like what would their lives be like? That, that pilot project for basic income was gonna explore those things until Doug Ford cut it off. But we need to be able to envision like a different world which actually supports people. And in terms, what does that world start to look like, basically? Obviously, it looks like defunding the police, sure. Um, but beyond that, like the court systems and the prison systems, for example. Decolonize. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Decolonize through and through. I mean, the system yeah. is not working it's working as desmond said the way it was designed to be working it needs mm -hmm. it needs to be you know stripped down and um you know re recreated because it's an absolute nightmare for bipoc people you know that are living within the grips of all of this uh you know injustice that they try to you know, cover as justice. And, and, and I think the, that the, I was just going to say, I don't think the answers are as far out of our grasp as sometimes we're led to believe. So mm -hmm. I'll, use, I'll use child welfare, which I mentioned earlier as an example of this. Where does the majority of the hundreds of millions of dollars, like provincially, that are spent every year in childcare, where does most of that money go? It goes to families other than the family whose children are being taken away. Exactly. Okay. In That's Manitoba. Yeah. Yeah. In, in Manitoba, they did a, a study on this. And again, we we we're just talking about Winnipeg and the high concentration of, of, of indigenous peoples, like 87% mm -hmm. of children who get taken away from their parents in Manitoba get taken away because their parents are deemed to be too poor to support them. Whenever no. they, whenever people think, Wait, I swear, I'm sorry. They, they, and then no, they'll, no, pay, no, no. they'll pay I'm the sorry. foster families, they'll pay the foster families thousands of dollars to take them in. The white Christian foster families, those foster yeah. families, but, yeah. but this is see scoop all over again. <laughs> But this is what we talk about. And so, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the NDP in Manitoba who were in opposition at the time tried to introduce legislation and their legislation was no more apprehending a child because their parents are too poor to support them. That legislation hasn't passed, but that would literally take away almost 90% of the work that yeah. child welfare services do in that province. And you could just give the money to the families that you're spending a bureaucracy to take away from. And yeah. yeah, in many cases, give to white foster families or to give to group homes where children are so often neglected and try to like run mm -hmm. away from and are put in placement mm -hmm. after placement after placement. Like, like the answer is really, really simple. But again, because 
a whole network of foster families, group homes, social mm -hmm. workers, and cops are getting paid off of the apprehension of children, they would really like for this reality to continue. Mm -hmm. So the answer is right in front of us, but it is about a political courage and an mm -hmm. organizing community to say, we really want and need that intervention. Yeah, yeah. That's why, um, you know, new legislation that was brought in this year uh, by the feds to give, you know, indigenous communities yes. like First Nations um, control, you know, over child welfare and stuff in their communities. I mean, it's a different in, you know, it's a different uh, situation involving um, urban areas and such like that. But there is some level of change starting to happen. The power given back, you know, to uh, the First Nations communities as to what happens to their children and you know um all of the resources and 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 things so uh, that's that's at least hopeful and like so when you think about it's a cradle to grave situation basically is that you're basically born into in into oppression like being born into slavery well, it's mm -hmm. like, it, it, that's what it, that's what I'm hearing, right? It's from birth to, um, to mm -hmm. some sort of organized, you know, daycare could call, call the cops on you if you can afford daycare, which is a whole nother story. But, um, you know, to school, to bylaw, to X, X, X. If something happens to you in between and you need some to access you know, some sort of institutional structure, you're screwed because that invites surveillance, basically. Can mm -hmm. we actually, can we talk a little, just at like our final thing, talk a little bit about surveillance and how that plays into everything? Sure. I mean, surveillance is a difficult thing to talk about because the nature of surveillance means that if you talk about it, this system makes you seem like you're out of your mind, like you're paranoid, right? So before yeah. people had access to data about police stops, they would say that we were all paranoid for believing that we yeah, were being stopped. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys make everything about race. The irony, though, is that those same people now say, oh, carding is gone and crime is going up because you can't stop people anymore. So five minutes ago, you were telling us that nobody actually gets stopped. But now that we're <laughs> yeah. fighting back against it, you're like, oh, taking away carding. Carding has never been taken away. Does it, like, I'll just wanna ask anyone watching this broadcast this evening, do you actually believe that the police by volunteering or by law have actually stopped going to, up to black and indigenous people in our communities and asking us for identities? Do you actually believe because a provincial directive, like a regulation, not a law, a regulation was passed that the police were like, yeah, okay, we're giving up on basically our main job in society, which is following around and surveilling black and indigenous people. They're still doing it. That we've but, been doing since the beginning of time. Of course, because mm -hmm. that information mm -hmm. about where we are and who we associate with and where we are going is of tremendous importance and value to them but we should mm -hmm. not also forget um the 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 larger mechanisms of surveillance that are even harder to see and pierce things like CSIS, things mm -hmm. like the no fly list which has criminalized untold thousands of muslim awesome. and arab and black people in this country just because of the name that they have, that they are put on these lists and can't fly. And every time they try to go somewhere, they are harassed or denied outright from flying, right? We have to remember the new, um, our, maybe people heard that uh, last year, you know, the Proud Boys were uh, put on the so-called terror watch list in Canada. And a lot of people were cheering about this, but you know, observers like Harsha Walia and Aziza Kanji always remind us that the terror watch list shouldn't even exist in the first place. Like a free society does not surveil citizens. It just doesn't do that. And so 
for every Proud Boys group that's on the list, there are like 25 groups that are associated with Arabs, Muslims, and Black folks who are also being watched and surveilled. And again, just talking about this in normal society makes you sound paranoid and out of your mind. But um, we have to remember all of those folks. You know, we have to remember the folks who have been swept up in this country on so-called security certificates and had secret trials where evidence against them was hidden because they were accused of terrorism. This is our country too, right? And Ottawa is a hub, a center of so much of that kind of surveillance. And we can never forget, you know, I was speaking with Aziza Kanji, brilliant legal scholar, an activist and writer, for those of you who don't know her, based here in Toronto. And Aziza was speaking to me really recently about how when we talk about racial discrimination, and we talk about uh, fighting against the police, we should not forget these federal and, and, and spying kinds of surveillance too, which are also, for example, spying on indigenous people who are organizing land resistance and environmental action. Like these are the tools that are being used to surveil those communities as well. So our fight against those things really unites a lot of resistance work. And Brandy, you must have seen a lot of that too, obviously. I mean, yeah, I mean, in general, I mean, we, we, we expect it. Um, but mm -hmm. the situations that I cover, you know, in my work, I mean, are land defenders and people that are protecting literally the ancestral territories that they come from are, um, flagged as terrorists you know in, yeah. in in their own territories and you know surveilled i've been even surveilled as an indigenous journalist covering you know these these stories you know by police so um i just want to say that you know just two years ago under two years ago actually the rcmp commissioner brenda lucky said that racism did not exist within the RCMP, within policing systems. We have a really long way to go. <laughs> if they cannot even acknowledge, and then a couple of few weeks later, apologize, stumbled over her words, you know, saying that she didn't understand, you know, what systemic racism meant. What ra meant. <laughs> but that um, was I laughable. Think, yeah. We, so so that's that's telling that's telling you know of the situation you know that that we're in but i would just love to be a fly on the wall inside the operations and the conversations within organizations such as the rcmp or you know city policing systems to see um what you know what they're you know what goes through their heads because i know that they they can't ignore what's going on they can't ignore what's in the media they can't ignore the different protests you know calling for the reform i would love to know um you know what the inside you know talk is and um who knows it, it'll probably never happen but i i just know we have a really long way to go but it's it's good that we are making progress just by talking, right? <laughs> so, well, <laughs> there, there are many ways I could go with that. <laughs> just like, <laughs> I like, the, you know, I, I look at this and I, I just see this big, like, in a way, it seems overwhelming. Um, but it's a, it's one of those fights that you can't afford not to engage in, at least for me. I well, remember when people are literally that, dying as well, when people are literally yeah. being shot down and targeted. Yeah, you know? exactly. And, you know, I think about the affordability crisis that we all talk about and how many people are going to slip into those types of, um, situations of, you know, precarity and homelessness and all of those things i mean what's going to happen to to a lot of people but the other thing too is that um 
I just wanted to pick up on something Desmond said, which was about Peter Slowly. I have gone, I've done deputations at the Ottawa Police Services Board. Um, I was at, you know, one of the meetings that talked about the wristband situation and when the black community confronted police about this and their whole thing was, well, officers were just trying to help their friend. That's their attitude. And um, I remember Peter slowly did a hell of a snow job, gaslighting, et cetera, to ensure that the police got their $13 million increase that they got last year. So yes, he, and let's remember that this is the same Peter slowly that unleashed a whole like riot squad on black and indigenous protesters the year before. So like a lot, you know, who is served? Well, I mean, who's in power really? Like the police behave as um, a self-directed paramilitary organization. That's what they are. They, they're not bound by law because there's no enforcement of that law. And therefore they're lawless. So if you don't, I don't know for people who are like, oh, oh, we don't need to defund, let's reform. I don't see how reform works. And I don't mm. see how you change the actual imp like uh, culture that has, that has begun since, I don't know, it's, it's again, before Canada's formation. So at this point, um, and with some of the, just the things that we've learned, I just think we should be further ahead. That's my thing. I, I, I'm all for talking and listening and learning and stuff as long as it leads somewhere. And I think one of the things we should be doing is starting to imagine what, um, you know, what, uh, defunding the police looks like, but also decolonize structures and what those actually mean. Like we need to move on in this conversation is my point. Instead of saying what is systemic racism, he a la Brenda Lucky and Rosemary mm -hmm. Barton. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Dang. Um, so I believe we are at our hour. Uh, you know, I just want to say um, thank you guys for coming on. Thank you all for coming on. Um, Brandy, I really look forward to your book. I really look forward to reading it. Um, oh. the stuff that I've just read from you is just fire, really. Oh. And no, it's, f I wish I could swear. It's fire, <laughs> Brandy. Wow. And, I and, there, and there, and, and it speaks to me. Like when you were mm -hmm. talking about Chevron and how corporations use, um, use the court system, you know, it just added another layer to this, that, you know, power will use whatever means that they can, not only mm -hmm. to shut you down, but to actually put you under the jail. Mm -hmm. The fact that resistance in itself is dangerous you know, is and and we turn around and talk about a free and just and fair society and what freedom looks like. I, I just, I saw I'm over, the, over that, you know? Yes. So yes. I just want to say thank you. I look forward to everything you tweet and write um, and and just, you know, you're, you've become such the eyes and ears for all, for a lot of us mm. in a very real mm. way. That doesn't that's go amazing. Over the issue. such an honor. I'm, so, I love, I love both of your work, and so it's such an honor for me to be here in the same spaces as you. So, hi, hi. I am, thank you. I am honored to share space with both of you, Desmond. As, as always, you know, you always. Every time you say something, I'm like this. <laughs> Sometimes I yes. look for your comments. Sometimes I'm like, oh. So Chief Slowly's gone. What's Desmond saying? <laughs> like literally I did that because I know that you will have um, a way to parse these things that maintain sort of like 
a march towards everything we're talking about, that defund and decolonizing type of framework. And um, I don't know how an anti-oppressive framework isn't a decolonized framework, to be honest. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for coming, Desmond. Thank you, Erica. And I, I just want to say real quick, like you had this amazing Twitter spaces conversation during the convoy, which went on for hours into the evening four. into the four <laughs> hours. Into, into, I, I, lis I listened to just about the entire thing. And um, I really think that that was a space of uh, venting like healthy venting and healing and sharing and reflecting for a lot of people. And I just want yeah. to say thank you to you for providing like that really much needed space when a lot of people were frustrated about what was happening in Ottawa and didn't, didn't know where they could have a good release to talk about it. You provided that space along with others. And I want to say thank you for that. And I want to shout out the people in Ottawa who were on Billings Bridge deciding that yes. a kind of um, a re-upping of supplies for the convoy was not going to happen in their neighborhood and went out by like the thousands to be like, no, we're not doing this today. That shows us a possibility for a way forward without policing where we try to intervene mm -hmm. in things in our own communities without calling the killers to come and try to mediate. So shout out to all the people who were a part of that and who were supporting their neighbors during like that really difficult time in Ottawa. Yeah. And I think, thank you for that. Like for, for, for me, I was in a lot of Twitter spaces that were talking about the Ottawa convoy, but they were talking about it from the perspective of where are the police? Why aren't they doing anything? Right. And that is a white centered perspective. It is very white um, because only white people can look at the police and say help and expect them, you know, to be helped. So I don't do that, you know, and I know a lot of other people don't do that. But what was so um, the stories were amazing. People's comments were amazing. But I stayed there because I, I knew that those space that space was needed. I knew that people needed that and on the other hand, like, we really need more of that, just, mm -hmm. just places and spaces for us to yeah. convene and to talk about these things. Because when we talk about stuff, the conversation is different. <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's just more forward looking, forward thinking. A lot of people were in that space talking about how we can reimagine these systems. This was what was so wonderful. How do we reimagine these systems? Not to serve power, but to serve the people who need them most. Um, how do we do that? And that's the con those are the conversations that BIPOC spaces have that I don't find in the, in the larger sort of landscape that that people are actually way beyond, what do we do without the police? No, no, no. They're already working on it. They're already imagining and building and using these different frameworks to build these, uh, to, to reimagine these systems. And I would love to see more of that, to be honest, because I really do think that we need to imagine. We need to see it. We need to be able to imagine that there is something else just because something was here before doesn't make it, you know, the best thing for everybody. So that's anyway, anyway that's my long piece. So I'm going to hand it over to Sean, if Sean is around. And I'm going to say good night to everybody. Um, uh, and just say, you know, um, let's continue to share space together and, and Seriously, like, let's continue to share space together. Thank hi, you, hi. everybody. Thank you.